Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are here on Delta Green Twitch, and this is your um, remote encrypted uh, evening with Acel uh, as the uh, travel advisory for Gen Con was honored by our foreign services staff. Uh, so we are here to answer um, any and all of your questions. Uh, and thank you all 42 of you currently for watching. That is really great. So, um, yeah, uh, we are here and I guess everyone should introduce themselves. I am Caleb Stokes. I am the guy. Oh, thank you for the subscription, Yashan. Uh, I am Heaven on G Cal on Twitter. I am doing a lot of the editing and, um, a lot of scenario writing for Delta Green as a result of the conspiracy Kickstarter. So. Uh, you need, you need to. I was going to say, Caleb, you ought to you ought to point to people when when you want us to say stuff. Okay, well, the cameras make that difficult. Yeah. Uh, well, with the inversion of light. Um, so, Dennis, you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm Dennis. I draw and paint and write and do a lot of stuff. I'm Dr. Gonzo one two three at Twitter, uh, and that's about it. Scott. Um, Scott Glancy, um, one of the writers of uh, Delta Green from. 25 years ago and still still doing it and uh i am uh i am opposed to twitter so i am not tweeting <laughs> you will not find me there <laughs> mr tines fair enough uh i'm john ogdg uh i am at john scott tines on twitter where i tweet dumb things and that is as street as this panel is likely to get <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm Shane, and uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm Shane Ivy, and on Facebook, I'm Shane Ivy, and my email is Shane Ivy at whatever you want to reach me at. And um, and uh, yeah, I'm publisher for Arcane Publishing and the, uh, the the current line of Delta Green materials. And you might have written something once or twice. And, and, and are, you, are you Shane Ivy at AOL? Do you still have that? Oh, you know what? I lied. That's the one place I did not get a Shane Ivey account. In fact, <laughs> even back in the day, Shane Ivey was taken by the time I got on AOL in like <laughs> 1993. Well, considering so, that I'm the I'm the only person left on the planet with an AOL account, I suggest you go back and check because I'm betting by now. Maybe, maybe they let it go by now. They've died. Just being really AOL, AOL, AOL might 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 still happen. Not too late. Just. Is some picture poor man named Shane Ivy. Why is this man threatening me by sending me pictures of World War II guns all the time? I just I, I picture Scott's Scott's email address at AOL is being run on some resold server box in someone's house. What the hell is this bandwidth? Oh, there's a there's a whole email. A delete like AOL ceased operations decades ago. It was all sold at auction and it's in some guy's house in Cupertino, like I gotta have some place for the junk. I gotta have some place for the junk mail to go. I don't want to go into my Gmail. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no lie. In, in ninety nine and two thousand, my uh, the, I worked for a, an entertainment dot com, and uh, at the time, everything was sort of they had started off. Everything they did was AOL keyword areas, so you would log into the AOL app to get your internet, and then within the AOL program, you would say, "I like." HP Lovecraft, and so it would take you to the HP Lovecraft corner of AOL. And so this company, they just built up their own entertainment corners of AOL. And to <laughs> to do that, like to do that, they had they had to send people up. And I was one of these people. They had to send send people up to Virginia to get trained in how to program the keyword areas. And then they would issue they issued you this little key fob that randomly changed its numbers so when you logged oh, into yeah. your aol keyword then it would say what does your key fob say alleged yeah, the two, user yeah the 2fa that that stuff was compromised by the nsa i don't know if you read about that warner brothers used it for years mm -hmm. and we got a general memo saying the ceo of this company has admitted to handing off the secondary access to the two-factor uh sometime in the mid 2000s to the nsa for a sum of money so stop using that and just create a new password. And <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, you know, this whole, this, that whole enterprise, I mean, if, if the, you know, the NSA wanted access to the, uh, 
the uh, sophomoric video game jokes we were all being paid to make than they had at them. But but this all felt it, it's not like half the guys you know, within a year say are. It's not like half the guys in the NSA aren't playing those games. I mean, it's just right, you know, right, yeah. it's just it's weaponized nerds. That was there. that was probably the real impetus for that program was the uh, the fans wanted to get access to all that shit, you know, without having to jump through hoops or pay subscriptions. Yeah, how do I get put GRM in my copy of Warcraft? Will you? Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah. Um, Anyway, um, so not that we're all big on structure, but we usually uh, usually start one of these off, if I recall okay. from attendance, with a sort of uh, state of the arc dream. Um, so you want to you want to give us caught up on that, Shane? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, we, we're, I guess, big picture, right? We've got um, we, we've as usual we have about half a dozen uh, books in development, in active development, and. Um, a, a number more kind of percolating, uh, which in my case means I have ideas for it and I'll put it in a text file somewhere and file it away to review later. Right. Right. And um, so the so the ones that we have actively about to come out include uh, God's Teeth, which is which I'm reviewing, and uh, Caleb wrote it, and Dennis went through it. And attacked it savagely, and um, it's, we had to check a couple up. of times. We had to check a couple of times with Caleb to make sure you know what's about to happen here is going to be ugly. Are you going to be okay with this? And, I mean, I was uh, fine with it until he's just like, "We've got the index and the table of contents. We can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> page numbers are gone." Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so that's uh, so that that's 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 moving along pretty well. Um, the conspiracy itself, the book that was uh, the first thing funded by this most recent Kickstarter, is really close. Um, Caleb's, I think, done with the the main text with that, but with revisions, right? And then Dennis is close to being finished with all the art for it. So, so that's going to be Ooh. imminent. And uh, we've got uh, Iconoclast, which just needs illustrations. John uh, Den uh, Scott's going through it one last time after the dozen or so times it's gone back and forth between us and with other editors. I just want to note I didn't expect 24 illustrations for for that. I just I just want to go out on a limb and say that that's generally a 128 page book and then I realized this is 128 what happened? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait. When you, uh, got, excuse me. when you got quality, but yeah. Wait a minute. Mr. Mr. Mission Creep is going to uh -huh. critique <laughs> my manuscript getting out of control. Yes. Okay, cool. That's yeah. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. He says, holding so, up this copy of Impossible Landscape <laughs> yeah. to beat a toddler. Okay. Right? Fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, what, what's, what's imminent after that? We've got a few uh, uh, shorter... Projects in the works is a couple of the labyrinth scenarios that are that are that are very very close, and um, and then yeah beyond that I mean we've got uh, Deep State which is heavily along the way Pisces is heavily along the way, and uh, and then and then beyond that is sort of the nebulous um, uh, nether world of uh, inchoate projects. projects yeah that are uh, those that's where the percolation is happening. All right, cool. Uh, so we're going to take questions. We got at least one in the chat. I hope to see more. But um, you want to hit us with it, Baz, our our lovely moderator. Mm, yes. Hi, Baz. Hello. <laughs> hey, Baz. I hey. Um, <laughs> uh, NCC three sixty asks. My first question is if terms like human and sigint will be replaced in the remaster of the nineties edition of the character sheet. Mainly as if my memory serves, they weren't terms back during the 90s. My they second were. question, they were. They were. My second were. question is, anyone else? John, <laughs> what's your uh, well, opinion Sigan, on that? Sigan, <laughs> um, Bills, though, has right? collapsed. It used to be like Lent and Fent for photography or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, they I think pretty much the, everything the is the skills. Now. I mean, so the so so one of the things that that I'm going to be drafting, I'm going to be writing up for the conspiracy is is a short, a short primer on 
how communications were weird and harder back then. And that'll affect the use of the skill SIGINT in some way, just because the tools were, were somewhat less advanced. But fundamentally, I mean, SIGINT has always been signals intelligence going back to the 1930s. Um, and, uh, and that's what it's still going to be. It's just its functions are, are less uh, or, or slightly different 25 years ago. Um, there's a second part to the question. Uh, if InfoSec was ever considered as a replacement for computer science when developing for the main game? Not really, because we wanted it to be broader than that. Um, inf uh, I mean, information security is part of computer science the way we envisioned it in the books. But, um, but, it, but, but in developing the skill lists, um, we put a lot of work into figuring out what we wanted to be a skill and what was too narrow to be a skill compared to the other skills, right? Because when you're creating a character, you only have so many points to divvy up. So if to, to, to throw, uh, you know, to throw a certain older game this, that this is that the, uh, under the bus, if you have an entire skill devoted to say headbutt, and then you have another entire skill devoted to medicine, then how you spend your points winds up looking kind of wonky. So, um, so yeah, so InfoSec is kind of a very narrow part of computer science, the way we envision the skills working. I need what separate game? skills to hide, slink, sneak, <laughs> right. tippy-toe, and... Uh, con conceal, con conceal things behind a cupboard, as opposed <laughs> to concealing things behind a rock. <laughs> yeah. Conceal, conceal cupboard. Look, <laughs> look palladium, palladium has separate rules for climbing up and climbing down. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the gold standard. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's certainly what I'm looking for when I look for quality. <laughs> wow. You know, honestly, you, you could say literally anything preceded by palladium has rules for it. And be like, yeah. Yeah, that checks it's, out. it's like number one, that's probably true. And number two, it's about to be entertained. Yeah, jar, <laughs> jar, jar opening modifier, negative twenty percent. Will Gunslinger, a game I know that is unrelated to Delta Green, be published independently or from Arc Dream? It'll be it'll be Arc Dream uh, eventually. It's a uh, you know it, that that's definitely a percolator. I mean, I've written a lot for it. And, uh, <laughs> I like but, how embarrassed he sounds. Yeah, a but lot. it's a uh, it's a. Uh, well, it, that's my that's my um, that's my me time project. You know, when I get burnt out on on work that actually pays the bills, you know, that that I'm kind of obligated to write. Uh, that therefore, it's a little stressful when my brain decides that stress is a thing it can't handle anymore. Um, my com my comfort food is, uh, in addition to comfort food, is um, writing other shit that just I enjoy. And uh, so, so gunslinger is gunslinger that thing so that's that's gonna that's my big that's my my sort of western game of kind of uh the historical west through the lens of stephen <laughs> and uh cormac mccarthy and um everything being really, really shitty and horrible all the time unless your characters do something about it mm -hmm. which they usually won't because <laughs> that's how players are they'll, they'll contribute to the horrible i mean you need somebody to burn a town yeah, down yeah. and set fire you know Shoot up the orphanage, call some player characters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Someone did say Palladium, Sublime Mime. And that, that's all we're going to say. Um, oh, we got another one. Is anything happening with the godlike RPG? I recall hearing something about a new edition. Uh, yeah. Like that. <laughs> well, let's, uh, I don't know. Dennis, why don't you take one? People already know yeah. my voice. Uh, so, Godlike has some interest outside of role-playing games. It's currently being kicked around Hollywood. We'll figure out whatever happens, happens. Uh, if there is some sort of uh, acceptance there and it comes to fruition, there will, of course, be a, another edition uh, rewritten and re-illustrated uh, at some point in the future. I have a deep love of the game, but, you know, we have to go where the interest is, uh, and we have a ton of Delta Green projects to hit. Um, so I'm really focused on that right now. Um, but there may be news shortly on that. Yeah, we love the game. I mean, that's so, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, 
Yep, yep, yep. That sums it up. I'm in a Godlike game right now, in fact, as a player, which is great. <laughs> what is your uh, your your unfortunate for you superpower? Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty. It's yeah, it's pretty good actually. Um, the uh, the character uh, we 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 built the characters as they they didn't start out as like trained commandos like the default is in Godlike, so they don't they didn't have as many useful skills. But um, the uh, instead they they started off with a higher budget for buying their weird powers, right? So um, so yeah, so my character is like a uh, um, he's a he's a young Jewish boxer from Lower East Side, um, uh, and uh, who was obsessed with Superman comics, and in a moment of crisis in the ring, you know, he sported his for his talent power. Which emerged, so he's got sort of Superman-ish powers from the old days. He's strong and bulletproof mostly, and um, and uh, and and you know has this. Uh, yeah, it's fun, and and but but the invincible conquest consequences from the gaming commission. Uh, and yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and uh, and has a couple of other things going on, you know. But usually, when he uses his powers, he's surrounded by this bright, brilliant crimson glow, almost like a cloak. Or a cape, and um, which which is which is all very fun. But of course, right now the part of the campaign is we're we're recruited by the OSS and like a week of spy training to go spy on shit. So every time he uses his powers, it's with the choice of okay, how much exposure do I want? The last guy, the last guy I, I played in the game was um, uh, he's called Chicken Fried Steak. Is his name? And that's all he can do is make his mother's chicken fried steak out of any <laughs> food you hand him. And he's on Guadalcanal, and Marines will walk. Oh yeah, yeah, three miles across combat to get a, right. a serving of chicken fried steak. For him. <laughs> exactly. He's constantly, and that's his only power. Um, oh yeah, no. As soon and, as that and, guy takes a bullet, morale is going to plummet through the yeah, floor. Yeah, no. So. And the, the captain so, is constantly throwing him yeah. into combat. Like you're one of those super guys. Go over the hill. <laughs> Oh, I can't God. do anything. Yeah. No, there's going to be some colonel or general who hears about that, and that captain's going to be very. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, so anyway, I, I, yeah. I, I know that the first character I'll want to play will be based off an old uh, champions character that a friend of mine came up with in high school called Collateral Dan, whose only superpower <laughs> was the ability to make hostages explode. <laughs> So they would just bring him in to defuse any hostage situation because the uh, the, the bank robbers are like, oh, we're done, done. Thanks. Never mind. No, let the hostages go. You know, he'd surrender immediately. I just love the ideas of like um, three American grenades and a chicken fried steak landing in like your trench. <laughs> And just trying to have to square that before you die, like how, yeah, he was very sad. Boom! <laughs> Bosses meat to really meat to chicken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, what else we got, Baz? Well, as an Oklahoman, I can tell you, chicken fried steak are basically grenades because you should <laughs> see the number of possible, like the number of ambulances that are outside the restaurants that serve that shit. <laughs> <laughs> um. What, what if we took what if we took red meat and made it worse? Added some. We need some way to give to put grease and oil out of. Not to mention yeah. as much flour as normally goes in a cake. Yeah, you know you gotta yeah. get that. Yeah. You know the yeah. flour we use to fry it. Let's and make sauce out of it. And then it's gonna need a lot more salt. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We got. Uh, any other? Any, uh, what about other uh, uh, one roll engine games such as Wild Talents, uh, etc.? There are quite a few. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we we don't have a lot of time right now. Uh, in the future, there's always options to continue any of these lines. I love. I have a deep love of all the one roll engine games. They're all quite mm -hmm. fun. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll write any or you guys tell me to. I, I, that's my yeah. favorite game system. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a great. It's it's the only game system I ever saw used once, and went, "What the fuck?" Like every every dice system I've ever seen, I went, "Okay, I understand that." Greg showed me it the first time, and I was like, "Do that again!" Like <laughs> like some sort of like some magic that? thing. Right, yeah. Right, what the yeah. fuck? How did you do that? 
Um, so yeah, I have, I have a deep love of that stuff. And it's just, it's, it's a matter of time commitment and the team. And right now Delta green is our focus, uh, for, uh, you know, a bit, a, a bit of time in the future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the bottom line is, as is, is, um, uh, the one roll engine games that, that we were our main focus for a long time, um, never paid enough to pay the bills and Delta Green does. Right? So that's we've got to make that math square to keep our families fed. Um mm -hmm. and uh so yeah once if if uh if things if things by some miracle <clears throat> get really compelling on the godlike front, then I think that's gonna wind up raising to reboot a lot of those related properties that were so 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 good all right what else we got um, uh, trapezi asks are there any plans for delta green to keep in touch with call of cthulhu and not talking about bringing the two lines together but if there's any chance both arc dream and chaosium names can be involved in the same projects in the future as it happened in the last unspeakable oath uh, names sure i mean we you know we often we often hire people Right, that work um, that work for for both companies. Yeah, I don't we think have, that's what he means. No? I think he means, uh, you know, a co-branded product. No, yeah, no, not a not a co-branded product. We have to be we have to be really cautious about that kind of thing because Delta Green very quickly once it pushed emerged as kind of a very distinctive, unique property and. Um, and so we we have to be we have to be about uh, keeping it that way, right? And so if you we uh, if we bring in too many too many things from other companies, then that uh, <clears throat> that both that both that I don't know that it puts everything at risk, you know, and it we're, we're confusing them. We're, and there's yeah, we're we're issues. great we're great fans of Chaosium. Oh, I love Chaosium to death, but but we've. You know, we've pretty much separated off. I think the first time we did that was, mm -hmm. um, you know, Cthulhu D20 very clearly sets all the properties as separate kind of things. And we've moved on past that. Um, and I still, you know, we collect Chaosium books, but we don't, mm -hmm. they handle their own thing and we handle our own thing. And we really want to just kind of um, cut a swath through modern conspiracy, uh, self-destructive horror um that's kind of what delta green is and it's very independent from what 1920s investigative horror of call of cthulhu is and we you know so the the answer is we love them they're really cool guys um but yeah we were we see them as separate entities and we really don't want to kind of step on their toes yeah no i mean i'm i'm in a, like one, um, I'm, in a <laughs> I'm in a more or less monthly uh room quest game now too i love you know with the new the new but uh but yeah so um yeah, I also think there's just the tones are too different, right? Like yeah. from 1920s, like 1920s is like, oh man, what if there's no god? And like Delta Green is like, <laughs> damn it, I wish there were no gods. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Delta Green is, yeah. yeah. Why haven't you committed suicide? <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of part of why Delta Green got going as a, as a, as a whole product line back in the 90s was that we were doing license books under Chaosium for Call of Cthulhu at Pagan Publishing. Um, and in talking with those guys regularly as we did, um, they were kind of asking like, you know, you guys are doing all this great stuff. It'd be great if you could like find lanes to be in that are not what we're doing for Cthulhu. Um, and that's kind of where we ended up doing like the Golden Dawn book in the Victorian times or Delta Green for the 90s um, to kind of steer clear of like their home turf basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that's kind of where we began to diverge from Cthulhu and we ended up just kind of finding our, our whole other path, um, that was really specific to Delta Green that we really wanted to like specialize in going forward. And anyway, I've learned over the years that it's enough of a hassle to work with these three, four guys that are on the screen with me, let alone having to have a whole other company's opinions to work with. Hey man, you yeah. bought me, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not. Uh, yeah, we're not buying Chaosium anytime soon. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It has been. Uh, it's been great to see the resurgence that Chaosium has gone through the last few years with Mike Mason. Those guys. I mean, they're, they're really. Once, yeah, once they're well, really. Jeff Richard came came aboard, and 
sort of helped bring everything together and yeah. steer the ship back onto yeah. from the open sea. Yeah, that's been fantastic. All right, Baz, hit me. Um, let's see. Uh, this is unlike. It said uh, NCC three sixty asks or says. I know this is unlikely, but will there uh, be plans for a handler screen reprint and maybe a '90s rethemed edition? Oh, I don't. Well, '90s rethemed edition, probably not. But the real issue on both of these is, yeah, Dennis, go yeah. there. You don't understand how big a piece of art that is. It's like the size <laughs> of a wall. Like the hand. If you don't want to get paid, art, it's done. Just print it. If you don't get it paid for that big a piece of art, you don't have to do it. I mean, you know. Don't uh, you, don't you get printer. paid by the inch? I mean, same as when you were a gigolo? Oh, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> I, uh, I get, <laughs> so, so Shane's like... That's a yeah, spice in me, Paul. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna get locked out of this uh, video chat pretty soon. <laughs> um, no, it's... It, it, we have the painting. It's there. Just reprint it. Goddamn lazy bastard. I've already told you. Do it! Just people I will make it. you a bespoke 90s theme handler's guide print out of uh, a series of old Lisa Frank folders. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> crayon. I was about to say, a 90s theme keeper screen or a handler's yeah. screen. Yeah, I will cover it in glitter. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's all we'll yeah, it on it's, everything. It's just two, like two trapper keepers glued together with super glue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with a dragon picture on one of them. Yeah, mm. yeah. I I totally did that in high school playing D and D Trapper yeah. Keeper DM screen. Um, how is the support done for Fall of Delta Green? Is it completely pell grain? Yes. Got it. Next. Sorry. Right. Now, <laughs> it, it, is, it is completely pell grain, so we have virtually nothing to say about it. Like when they have a new when they have new, they send it to us for review. Um, but we generally take a pretty light hand with. Because we know Simon, we know uh, uh, Ken very well. They have good judgment. You know, yeah. they they're not they're not likely that's going to uh, you know get involved all that hard, send opinions or ideas. But but yeah, they kind of they have their own their own thing going with. Ball. Now they have Gareth. Now they have Gareth. Working yeah. On it, so yeah, and we trust. I mean, you know, we that, that, that's a team that we can rely on. In so. So they're do the, so yeah we're not uh, and if they mess it up we can you know we yeah. wait for them in their hotel rooms with a baseball bat we know right. where they live yeah. that's what Gen that's what Gen Con is for right? <laughs> yeah I mean I think we're currently looking towards the release of uh, Borellis Connection um, mm -hmm. by Ken and Gareth and we'll you know, that, that which should be we saw versions of that early on that were really cool so they'll get that mm -hmm. out here sooner or later yeah. Um, Spinit one two three asks: Are there any thoughts about doing more audiobooks for game books like Need to Know? I mean that 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 depends entirely on sales, right? And um, the uh, so 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 probably not, but um, but it's kind of a met like Aaron Vanek was sir. Um, if he comes back to us and says that he's got a really compelling commitment to make for you know. Doing another one of those, uh, if it's doing well enough for him, is is the real issue that he wants to keep spearheading them, then he can keep working with. Them. But that's that's another thing that's kind of on Aaron because I don't have the skill set to develop audiobooks, and I don't have the time to learn that skill set. So that's pretty much entirely in somebody expert that. Way. We're having some audio issues on your end, Shane. You're cutting it oh, down on us. Shit, sorry. Hold on. I'm going to bring my. I'm bringing my microphone closer. Ah, okay. there. Yeah, there. But um, as the person who said they missed the Pelgrane answer, yes, Pelgrane is completely uh, independent in that aspect. Yeah, Fall of Delta Green is 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 entirely in their hands. We only get involved in reviews and sending kind of big picture observations and suggestions. All right, um, Dennis. I hear there was there was an RPG you made that involved people, inv oh, involved playing characters in an insane asylum. I haven't been able to find it. Was this yes. a rumor or some early project? No, no, it, it's a real thing. Uh, it's on the internet. It's called Insylum, and it's I, I, I may I actually I wanted to make it a long time ago, and then I put it up and said, oh, I'm working on this thing, and I don't have the money to do it. And some guy was like, how much? 
And I said, oh, I don't know, X. And he said, here's a check. And I went, okay, well, I guess I got to go make the game now. <laughs> so I did. Um, and it's it's free and available on the internet somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, if you just search for I-N-S-Y-L-U-M, you should be able to find it in PDF somewhere. It's probably, um, I, 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 think, I think I uploaded a copy of that to Arc Dream somewhere, so. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. it's free. Uh, it's basically a, a King in Yellow mini role-playing game. Uh, and a lot of the ideas that have survived to um, populate impossible landscapes began there. Uh, Dr. Friend and other fun characters, all <laughs> Mr. Ed, the horseman, all began in that game. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, I haven't thought about it in a long time. I actually forgot about it until you mentioned it. But, yes, it does exist. I have a question. <laughs> so we own Julia Childs now, right? She was given to us. <laughs> she's she's canon. Green IP. Yeah, yeah. She's canon. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah. I think the bold new direction we need is just reclaiming other historical figures in the conspiracy. Like, you know, how Mormons baptize people after they're dead. We can just take people and actually <laughs> they were part of it all along. So, like, you only get one, though. So which historical figure do you make part of Delta Green? George, jo George Burns. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's pretty good. People. Yeah, on, on the side, all throughout the 20s, up till modern times in the 70s, you know, doing hits on Oh God, You Devil, and <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, but Julia Child is just like a default. Like, we didn't really, it's like a, unless they go to, they go to a court with it, we just own her idea outright, right? So, mm -hmm. And it yeah. came out of, unless they're really, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, like, <laughs> well, like that declassified. guy, like, like so, that supporter obviously. that came up to Dennis and said, here's free money. Just, you know, give, do that yeah. thing that sounds fun. You know, somebody just came out with Julia Childs and Delta Green. We're like, oh, and I know, okay, exa I know exactly where it came from. It came from like a drunken Google search at two yeah, in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For like OSS, uh, Far East Occult or something like that. And it went to one of the mm -hmm. Delta Green pages with like, I just I can't believe every time I read that it makes me laugh. More. It's so yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's I great. want John Madden because I want him to do <laughs> on what it, I think the agent that survives this is going to be the one that doesn't get eaten, and then just a bunch of other like eighties <laughs> FBI guys are just like, thanks, John. Thanks for that. You want to load your weapon or Jesus? Like, yeah, I, I just want that. Uh, I, I would I would love. Uh... Love uh, Christopher Lee. He had such an Good awesome uh, uh, bat oh, historical yeah. background already. Uh, deeply capable. <laughs> <Don't be crazy. laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Unusually competent. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know, everything was fine as long as Christopher Lee was holding shit together for Delta Green in between his movies. It's fine for Christopher Lee. I mean, he walked out of airplane yeah. crashes and things, but, you know, yeah. who knows where the yeah. rest of the... The rest well, of the team true. is digesting yeah. somewhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, yeah like, we've all seen, pl seen plenty of operations where the one competent agent did not exactly convey all of that luck to anyone else. We we would recommend Brian Blessed as well, but his stealth roles are just <laughs> appalling. Yeah, no. it's like we're sneaking to the far building now. <laughs> <laughs> Falls is alive, uh, you know. Yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> Um, I want to go with uh, Warren Zevon. <laughs> that is that is my option for actually actually involved is uh, singer songwriter Warren Zevon. Since I feel like Warren Zevon is an add up to the fate if he's anything. Like I, I'm not sure he's working for the good guys. I think he's yeah. yeah he's uh, an asset more than an I agent. See, <laughs> I see that lyrics and I think he's seen some shit clearly. It's true. I, my, my, I also have never seen Baron Zevon in a room where I'm just like, man, he looks nondescript. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. He's, he was tiny. I I got to <laughs> I got to be a Warren Zevon roadie at college one time, and the thing that mm. stood out about Warren Zevon was that uh, you would miss him. He was actually the smallest person in the room, not quite oompa loompa <laughs> sized, but he was just just this tiny little slight dude who just drifted through the room without pushing air in front of him. You know what I mean? He just... <laughs> yeah. 
think I would, uh, in the spirit of trying to min max the game, um, I would vote for Fred Rogers because I think that he would have like several million bonds, each of which is an individual connection with a specific child. Mm -hmm. And so like he could just like blow through like every horror known to humanity and just like, 99, yeah. burn bonds <laughs> left and right. Just like, nope, nope, nope. I'm just walking through here. I don't care. And he'd be fine. He'd yeah, be incredibly every spell effective. in the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you just you just have like millions of bonds, no in problem. The, in, like, the aggregate, back. in the aggregate, he'd be nicer to more kids that he kicked at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's correct. Yeah. Uh I guess my my uh my, my backup would probably be somebody like Virginia Hall. You know, there's this whole slate of female uh World War Two um operatives with the OSS and the SOE that were just like living superheroes. I, mean, I don't think a lot, a lot of them died, but all. until like, they die, <laughs> they were superheroes. Everybody rolls a one eventually. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, all right, I was, was going to say that you know who's the better quintessential cowboy agent than Ernest Hemingway, but <laughs> Just a lot of friendly fire is there against his. Hey, own you know what? The I, same I, as my I'm games. The... <laughs> 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 Not I to be too Donovan, shitty, Donovan, but Don, Donovan would be that guy. I mean, like the story on the beach, Scott. You know that one. It, the yeah, it, it insists on landing on the D-Day beach. You know, he he's one of seven men who knows about the atomic bomb in the European theater, and they they, they think they're going to get overrun. So he turns to his secretary and goes, "I'll do you, you know, and then I'll do myself before they get us. No worries." That was done. <laughs> the secretary is like. Whoa! Thank I you, Bill. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's why I had to shoot the director. I was afraid we were going to be overrun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Donovan, man. Crazy. All right, let's see. What is the process when making errata changes, like raising improvements from 1.1d4? Do you get fan mail of statistics, internal testing, etc.? I mean, it, it it varies from item to item. A lot of a lot of things. There's an errata sheet, you know, that's out there for download on on the websites uh, for the agents, mainly for the agents' handbook. The um, but uh, I mean, some of that just comes in from fans where it's there's obviously an error or a mistake, right? That we can just correct. Um, you know the uh, the experience thing kind of evolved a little organically, and that that was that mostly was that was in fact I think that was entirely me just my experience running the game long term over the couple of years after it came out, finding that uh, that uh, character advancement needed to be tweaked a little bit to make it more interesting and to make it more. Um, fulfilling you know and to give players a sense more of a sense that their characters if they manage to survive uh in addition to becoming emotional and psychological train wrecks they were also getting good at killing people cool yeah you're not going to the range and like this bullet hole looks like a d6 this one's a d8 <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Uh, what else we got? I think we're caught up on questions. We are oh, well, there's a little tiny mini question. When are you guys doing a uh, Delta Green mini fiction of Julia Child? <laughs> I, I'll say this: the second I am allowed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that I think we'll need to do that as its own audio book. You know, we need to find the <laughs> right a, narrator, the right character. Good point. <laughs> like, it's like it's like what, 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 what do you what do you write like? Unintelligible turkey noises. That's like the sound effect. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, we, I mean, Dan well, Aykroyd's Dan Aykroyd's still alive, so maybe he could do the voice. I mean, he was, <laughs> yeah. the, I mean, he was the gold standard Julia Child from the seventies from SNL. I remember? Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, True. Yeah, yeah, definitely a <clears throat> um, disorder with alcoholism. And then, like in parentheses, Sherry. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm the character. A little of the food, a little of the cook, a little for me. Uh, yeah. Oh, what is the so, status? John, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Baz. I thought we were. Uh, I thought uh, we were. We were back into free time. 
uh, <laughs> you can have you can have a moment of free time. There aren't many questions. We'll see if someone build up in the interim. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to encourage John to uh, regale us with some tales of Delta Green's earliest days. It's uh, development. It's authorship. Sure. It's research. It's uh, what 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 was most inspirational. Boy, um, you know, the very beginning of Delta Green was uh, came out of a um, a game that uh, Blair Reynolds uh, ran for us uh, at Pagan House back in Missouri um, in the early '90s. Um, he wanted to do a uh, an event, like kind of a one off set in um, more or less in Vietnam, Cambodia. I forget. I think maybe it was in Cambodia specifically, and it, and it's essentially what turned into. Um, the disaster in Cambodia that, that kind of screwed over Delta Green and so on. Um, his version of it was very different, um, but and that was but we played, you know, I, I, like my character was Adolf Lepus, who you may recall from Majestic and so forth. Uh, Dennis, your character was uh, Curtis McRae. That's right. Yep, and Brian played Poe, who turned up here yep. and there as well. Um, so we we made those characters and played them in that session. And Delta Green wasn't in that adventure. Like it was just kind of like we were soldiers in this situation, mm -hmm. and it all goes to crap. And oh my god! Now in Blair's version, um, the supernatural like climax manifestation thing, as I recall, was this entity he called the Black Buddha, that yeah. kind of like rose up out of a statue in this ruin um, and had an enormous phallus. <laughs> that um and he like was like rampaging across the ruins and the jungle and destroying things everyone was panicking and soldiers were screaming and going insane and uh and it he went didn't, poorly. He didn't put, he didn't put that in the cover painting <laughs> no well, apparently well, not he's one dude has turned away <laughs> i was gonna say yeah yeah that's, right. that's the problem you're facing you're seeing it from that's the wrong what they're staring at when they're <laughs> right all those the three horror, guys the in the horror. black t-shirts looking appalled yeah it's not because it's not because the statue's <laughs> limbs aren't connected just yeah. imagining a dick drawn by brain realize exploding into sort of sort of VD yeah. ha halo of like mm -hmm. fifty of them swirling around. He used to he used to show us the weirdest <laughs> shit too. There was some anime he was showing us that like he go, Oh, this is what it looks like. Show us this anime. <laughs> <laughs> and it was or it was horrific. It was like, what the fuck is this? And he'd show us like three minutes of it and be like, okay, just imagine that. But you're in camp, you know. It's like fuck. I would I would rather not. Yeah. <laughs> Theater of the mind, Blair. Theater of the mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that but that adventure we played, like it was, you know, it was great and it was kind of batshit because he ran really batshit adventures. Um You don't have to talk. But, hey. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, but we got to, we were talking about it and enjoyed it, and we're like, you know, what if we did like this, you know, kind of modern day um, Cthulhu thing uh, that was sort of you know conspiracies and so on, and and, it, and we kind of grew up like that that element from that adventure became part of the backstory that we invented for Delta Green, um, and that first appearance was in the Unspeakable Oath number seven, um, and that came about in part because um, I was uh, had become friends with this guy, um, Thaddeus Howes, who was much like Pagan, was doing a zine uh, for a different game. He was doing a zine for the Artal Saurian cyberpunk RPG um, that was called uh, Interface, I think was the name of his zine. And we were both like publishing zines for other people's games we were really into, and so I met up with Thaddeus in San Francisco on a trip, and um and we discussed um like let's do a crossover we'll do a, like a like a first part in the unspeakable oath and then a sequel in interface and so actually the original convergence was part one of that two-part crossover and so the proto matter stuff and convergence then i i did a scenario uh with those guys for interface it was a cyberpunk adventure um with proto matter now in you know whenever cyberpunk was set 2020 or something <laughs> <laughs> um and <laughs> to kind of continue it, with it, it, might, bring, it might have been that might have been when it was still 2013 was the i cyber probably cyber. yeah probably yeah so that was that was kind of where that started but by the time that we actually had finished that issue and i had written up the delta green stuff and talked it over with you know denison company like it had really kind of gone its own direction so while we we kept that crossover for the for the issue but it had become like kind of its own weird thing at that point um, and once we did that issue, then it went, you know, it was well received and we decided like, let's make a book. And then, you know, four years later, um, we, we, we finally shipped the Delta Green source book, um, which took a long time. And that it got going in part as well, because Scott wrote to me from Florida 
This is back when we had letters, like paper sure. letters paper in the mail. Letters, yeah. Yeah. Like, and, didn't, you, didn't you send a, like a binder? <clears throat> like I recall Scott having like a history thing, this incredibly detailed printed out thing that was like, here's the history of Delta Green. And we were all like, what the hell? This is awesome. Yeah, we like, did eventually get, but it started with, yeah. cause I think Scott, you had like an adventure that was kind of like, had like men in black and stuff, but it wasn't Delta Green. It was pretty. Yeah, I had, a, I had gotten this idea. Um, and again, we're still months out before um, Fox drops X-Files. And I had gotten yeah. this idea about, uh, and I had submitted it to Challenge Magazine, which is the only gaming magazine at the time that was printing any Call of Cthulhu stuff. Um, and at least I, that I really recall. I don't think Dragon was putting out that much of it. So I, I tried yeah. Challenge, and uh, there was an idea of how to incorporate the Men in Black into a Call of Cthulhu scenario, uh, game. Not as a, uh, here's a game with the Men in Black as a thing, but how to use that UFO mythology to muddy things for your players and how to keep them off uh, off balance. The idea was basically, you know, that this would be a, an avenue for getting adventures to players in Call of Cthulhu. Rather than having an uncle die, there'd be these mysterious guys who would show up and leave a newspaper on your doorstep or whatever, you know, say, you know, with a circle around the obit or the article or whatever and they would be getting stuff to the players to act as the cat's paw mind detector for whoever these people were but you don't know what their agenda is and i said that to john and john's response was that's cute you should wait for the next issue of the oath to come out and so i run down <laughs> to the local store in gainesville florida and pick it up and i'm just like oh god damn it you know it, it, there it is <laughs> shit so i'm like well do you have anything that needs to get done for Delta Green, or is there anything I could do for it? And he's like, well, we're looking on putting together a thing about government agencies. And I'm like, well, I'm in law school, and I put together this massive job search where I was looking at all these federal agencies that employ lawyers. And let's be honest, William Donovan was a lawyer. There's a lot of lawyers adjacent to spook stuff. Let me see how close I can get this. And so I vomited out my job search. Uh <laughs> To John and got a phone call was what happened. It was, there was like, uh, uh, which you know, that, that's, like, that, that's some long distance shit at that point too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I right. and I like to pretend that he got this. It was just like you know whatever I sent him. And it's like okay, we can't let this guy get away. He does too much work, you know, without getting paid, right? So you know, this was just on spec. So let's see what else. <laughs> Let's see what else we can get him to do for us, right? Because, you know, clearly, we, I didn't give him any money, and I got a thing, that I got a phone book, so let's see what else. He's like, say, what would you also, well, now that we've got you on the phone here, maybe you'd like to do some more things for Delta Green. So he just started hitting me assignments, like saucer watch and uh, some background history and, um, uh, you know, flushing out that for, and, he, and John sent me his own phone book, which was all this online research that you had done about uh you know ufology research around the majestic 12 documents and that mythology and um what's his name uh, uh another bill whose name i'm forgetting uh from uh comes a pale horse or you know what i mean you know i'm talking bill cooper you sent oh, me a bunch yeah, of bill yeah yeah bill cooper you sent me a bunch of crazy Bill Cooper shit, and I'm like, well, you know, if he says it's if he says this is really happening, we don't have to care about copyright, you know. <laughs> 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 you know, he's not he can't say he, yeah. Look at that. you can't. He's like, I thought you said this was real, Bill. No, that wouldn't stop Bill right. Cooper. He was a freaking, <laughs> he was a maniac. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's how I got folded. Yeah. My big question. I think, I think my Oh, Hold sorry, it. Go Just, I'm going to throw something back to John. Um, uh, Delta Green quickly evolved into sort of a little bit what I was thinking about is a avenue for providing replacement characters and the next job to a group of players. So they'd always have a reason why they're going to go out and do this. They're always going to have a way for new people to join the group. You know, um, how much of that was... I mean, that feels like almost exactly what was going on with, uh, with Golden Dawn, you know, that Golden Dawn was, how can we have something where you're always going to have a new mission, you're always going to have 
a recruiting ground for the next investigator. Um, how much of that theme of providing a campaign structure for Call of Cthulhu was floating around Pagan Publishing at the time that uh, both yeah. Delta Green and Golden Dawn, which again, I will, I will notice as GD at DG. <laughs> yeah, no, that, not aside from the naming thing, um, that was 100% intentional. Uh, and that came out of those conversations I was having with Chiasium around, like, how do we stay out of their swim lane for 20s Cthulhu as much as we can? And so we're like, well, let's kick off Golden Dawn um, and we'll kick off Delta Green. And they and the, both of them were intended to solve that problem. Um, I, think, I think we called them narrative frameworks at the time was sort of the idea of just giving you a framework in which you have character creation, you have replacement characters, you've got jobs to do. Um, and, and that really came out of my experience as a player in uh, John Crow's Mask of Nyarlathotep campaign in college, um, where, you know, like my first character died in the first 10 minutes and we just had people dying left and right. And we had to have replacement characters and, you know, they were just like tissue paper out of a box, right? Just sh -sh -sh. so. And we had no rationale for why these new characters would join us. It literally would be like, you know, like the bell clerk at the hotel where we're staying and one of our guys just died and John's like, and you're the bell clerk. Hey, and like, hey guys, I have a shotgun. Let's go fight monsters. Like, like it just made no sense. And that's not unique to the John's campaign. That was just the way it was. Like there wasn't really like an established plan in, in the rule book in those days for how you would do that or, or like or why how you would justify it narratively. I don't think we even cared about justifying it narratively. Like I don't remember ever having questions the gaming table back in the early 90s about like how do your characters know each other like i don't know like i'm a detective he's a professor <laughs> you're a tribal fisherman let's go like that would be it <laughs> and, stuff like, happened move on yeah right so we just kind of like you know glossed over that and sort of jumped in immediate immediate rose um but so that was a, a, def a deficit that we saw um that we kind of wanted to address and so we saw both golden dawn and delta green as like here are two kind of sticks in the ground for how we imagine you could do a campaign that was coherent that could continue across multiple characters and evolve over time and have more of a framework to it to what's occurring and why and that, that was very much the goal uh for both those projects and, and they both were going simultaneously those were both concurrent projects at the time one of them were super successful and we're meeting about it today and the other one was the golden dawn <laughs> <laughs> I really great. like Golden Dawn. It's a it's great awesome book. book. I love yeah. it. Yeah, it but... totally is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do... About the creation of Delta Green. I'm aghasted at your missive <laughs> and headed straight down to the dry goods store to buy the latest. I was, I was, I was going. Though. Yeah, I was going through uh, when preparing to move up here. Uh, I, I had to go through all of my accumulated detritus of like printouts and notes and shit that I had gathered well, I for decades. Totally lived. <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, but among that, some of the things that I kept were um, things that I'd printed out for one reason or another um, back in the early '90s when I first started corresponding with uh, John and Dennis on AOL about pagan publishing stuff and the oath and the king in yellow and uh you know this is for printers when they worked that was yeah, awesome. yeah 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 i miss printers i just want to yeah, slow I... pan over you and john eating handfuls of benadryl well <laughs> <Later. laughs> seriously yeah 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 the early days of pagan of course it was all you know letters like printed physical letters with stamps on them yeah. Um, and in those days I would, I would write somebody a letter and I would print two copies and I would mail them one and I would stick one in my file box with, mm -hmm. with their copies of their correspondence. So like, I still have a box in my garage right now. that has like the first two years of pagan publishing correspondence it was all figuring out those early projects and so on. Um, but then when email happened and we just, we, we lost everything. So that's how it yeah. goes. <laughs> just slipped away oh, from I, us. I, yeah. The, the I, internet. I, 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 I was going to say that the most vivid memory I have of Delta Green is being at the pub uh, in Seattle on, what, 45th Street? What was it? Murphy's. Murphy's. Yeah. And we were all very drunk, and we were all arguing about the cover of Delta Green. It was me, you, and Appleton, I think, times. And we were all, all right. just hammered. And there was a... We knew the waitress for some reason, and she was very kind and kept bringing 
pitchers well past the point she should have brought pitchers. Uh, and then we were drawing on, you know, I just remember sketching out the cover yep. on a, on like a napkin or something where I was like, here's the triangle and it's half a cup. And I, I, I that's vividly in, in, uh, stuck in my mind. And then Appleton making sure I didn't fall into the street on the way home, him hanging out on my, my collar. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was, a, it was a very strange time and Delta green came together in a very odd way where Scott wrote reams, John wrote reams. I wrote a little bit and then I wrote a bit more and did a lot of the art. Um, and it all just kind of got mixed together in this uh, crazy way. But the the biggest influence for me on, on it was, John, well, one, John's idea and Convergence was amazing. That was just, that was mm-hmm. it. Um, and you could see very clearly, this is the flag. Everybody rally around this flag. This is where we need to be. And then Scott wrote this. I still have a vivid memory of a giant fucking black binder filled with printout pages of like in 1952, this happened. It was like, this is fucking awesome. This is just, it was totally exactly what I wanted to see uh, out of this thing. Um, And those two things together, it was like, you couldn't help but make really neat stuff. Even being near it, you were like, but what if this happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that history stuff that Scott did when we first got that draft in, that was like the whole timeline of Delta Green weaving all these historical military conspiracy, et cetera, stuff into the Delta Green experience. Um, like it was jaw dropping when that showed up yeah. um, and it, it did just blow our minds. And 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 part of it is like, like it was really immersive, like it made you feel like this is a real thing and you could believe it. And as you read through it, you're just like, oh, my God, that's what was going on. Holy shit. <laughs> and it like again and again, it just kept having those surprises. It was kind of like they weren't even the Easter eggs. It was just the mythos stuff. That's just the shit. Our taxpayer dollars were up to it. Any given <laughs> <laughs> right. 1947 in the last week. I mean, that yeah. was the- <laughs> but Scott, but Scott, the, the genius of that section for me, was none of the obvious choices were made. It, it, you know, the default setting of someone stepping out to make some Cthulhu mythos thing is like, what if Cthulhu was behind the A-bomb? And what if, like, Kennedy was killed by deep ones? Right. You know, that's like where everybody jumps. And Scott was like, fuck that. That's, the real world's fucked up enough. Here's what was really going on. And here's some isolated, horrible bits put in in a believable way that, that kind of, you know, dead men tell no tales. These these things would occur and eat you don't, themselves. You don't see Deep Woods on the Zabruder film. That's not going to happen. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but that that's what set it apart so much, was that, you know, all the pseudo-historical Cthulhu stuff I had read before in fiction, and, and there was a bunch of it, just kind of random, uh, always went for these really stupidly obvious, like, holy fuck, everybody would know what was going on by 1970 if that happened in you know, but Scott right. didn't go there. Uh, it was, a, yeah, it's a very distinctive sensibility. I mean, in the 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 oak back in the day, I remember, I remember really enjoying. Who was it? Philip Garland was, the, I think, was the writer's name oh, who wrote a bunch of historical uh, feature articles. Kind of, you know, here's how the Cthulhu mythos might be involved in this historical thingy, um, which were great, but they had kind of, it, it, but but it was it was it was a different feel it was a different tone and approach the and the yeah. thematic approach the other thing i wanted to mention dennis from that that uh that night at the pub when we sketched out the cover design for the delta green yeah. box um was that at, and that at that point in that conversation we were imagining it as a box set like an old right. school like 80s mm-hmm. 90s box set and so we were like okay there'll be three books like the delta green, the green book box. and the adventure <laughs> yeah. book and da da yeah and like that whole thing we, that's what we were imagining and envisioning and we were planning like the writing of the project kind of around that right. idea um right. but then I, I think we figured out before too much longer that box sets are really stupidly expensive to produce and so we're like <laughs> yeah. nah, fuck even fuck. even <laughs> even back then the smart money is on box sets are going to kill us yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly <laughs> We, we could have made it a stretch goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so you could right, have, have a box on your bookshelf that slowly falls apart around the books. Yeah. That's what yeah. happens to box sets. You know, but we could have I guess I could have gotten adventurous and made a made a a box that would contain the hardback books and you could just <laughs> open up the box and then take the hardback set. I mean, you just you pick up the box, and the bottom would just drop out immediately as the books fell <laughs> to the floor. And like, oh, that's oh, how, wow. yeah, that, that's that, that's the, that's the shape that all of my uh, 
All of my old Chaosium boxed games are in there. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah, just so. they're just sort of skeletons that are held together by uh by tape. Ah, see, yeah. there we go. See that? Oh that's yeah, yeah, that's right there. there. It's yeah, that, yeah, too. yeah. My 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 uh, my copy of that game, was my first role playing game, and and that box didn't survive two years of. Yeah. Once I no. once I got in, you know, once I picked up once I picked up that drug, uh, you know, the the the, the I wore the works out for it within yeah. within months. Yep. Uh, all right, Baz, you want to hit us with some questions? Yeah. Good. There was a recording of the last message from General Fairfield, and it was awesome. Have you considered more of such audio handouts for other scenarios? Yeah, those are fun. That was John. You've got that was your doing, right? You, uh, your dad. Yeah. So my my dad um, uh, was a radio DJ, and he's been his whole career in radio as an announcer and broadcaster and so forth. So he's got a great radio voice, um, and uh, he actually just produced that on his own. Like he, he, he saw the stuff from Delta green and thought it was really cool. And then he just like emailed me one day, you know, many years ago and was like, Hey, I recorded <laughs> that opening letter from your book. Uh, I thought it was kind of cool. So I did this thing and he put sound effects and stuff in there. Um, and that's my dad's voice doing that. But he just like up and did that, like probably circa like 98 or 99, I would guess somewhere in there. Wow. Um, so it wasn't anything that we like commissioned or planned, like many things. It just it just kind of happened. It was really cool, and like yeah, you know. <laughs> so are there gonna be more any more of those? Right. I don't know. Like my my dad's not really recording these days. He's retired. So. <laughs> you oh, got me. I, I don't know. Knew, you want? I knew to? it was your. I knew it was your dad's voice, but I presumed you brought this to him as a project. I didn't realize he just no. cooked it up on his own. That's so great. Oh, no, he read that. Old, he read that old intro letter when the book came out, and he was like, "That's fucking awesome." He just recorded that because he wanted to. <laughs> What's really funny is imagining John's dad as like a hard swearing killer. It's it's, no. it's such a ridiculous yeah two ends of the. He's like the nicest, happy guy. <laughs> oh yeah, he's a sweetheart. Yeah, I know. It was, yeah. it was really Genius. like jarring to hear his voice coming out of my ears. <laughs> imagine, him, like, imagine him doing like you know shots of Cuddy Sark with a smoking pistol and bodies all around. <laughs> it's just a really funny picture in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a totally weird combination. But yeah, it was great. He did, a, he did a really great job with it. It was fun. I actually, I did actually recruit him for some voice work um, when I was working on virtual reality projects at my last job. Because um, like he, they retired to the area because we have a kid, so the grandparent mm -hmm. thing. Um, and we were making some VR stuff. It was actually some VR kind of ghost story stuff. Um, and I was like, you know, my dad's got a great voice. Let's get his ass in here and record some things. So, <laughs> so he did actually do some That's more great. recording deliberately this time, uh, but not in Delta Green, I'm afraid. Um, I can do audio stuff whenever. I just need uh, people more talented than me to do the word part. Um, so, but I can edit that stuff now. So. If that's something people are interested in, um, that's something we could do on Dead Channels or or, or various. Other and we own we own Caleb now. And you do own me, so. Um, okay. Sweet. Um, what else we got, Baz? Um, where where are you at with God's Teeth? PKD fan asks. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we said earlier, I'm at this point. Uh, I'm going through the text. It's gone. It's gone through two or three layers of uh, of editing and reviews and revisions, and so I'm I'm going through it now with a uh, fine tooth comb and, uh, and uh, gather some, you know, just sort of nudging some things into a shape that I prefer. Um, and you're breaking up thing, again, Shane. Nudging some things into sh into a shape that I'll prefer and. Making notes on other things that I that I might need Caleb's input on as the actual author of the th of, of the, work. but uh, but that's in progress. And then um, I think that and Iconoclasts are Dennis's next big art projects. I right now for God's Teeth, uh, I uh, one quarter of the illustrations. I think um, so. I have a lot to go, but uh, it's fun illustrating. I get to I get to paint the old dog next oh, um, which which is awesome <laughs> sorry uh, no no spoilers but really cool image and lots of really nice stuff in there um but i'm looking forward to it uh, i was having real fun painting babushka's house the other day Ooh. yeah 
<laughs> the last thing I want to see is Caleb's ideas brought to art. It's going to be terrifying. <laughs> um, were there any attempts or ideas to bring something in the vein of Delta Green Expanded Universe apart from books? I vaguely remember a video game. Is what? Uh, yeah, so there, there was a attempt at a video game uh, that um, we worked on many years ago. It's sort of been like... 2001 i think yeah 2000 um a local game studio um flying lab software wanted to do a delta green video game um and so i ended up working with them full time for a while on that project and we were trying to find a publisher who would fund it basically so we built a prototype um and pitch materials and so forth and then we just we went and talked to everybody talking microsoft and sony and ea and all kinds of people um, and we couldn't get anybody to fund it. So like, oh, well, and that was the end of it. So, um, there, we did put out some stuff around it. We put out a, but somebody yeah, well then instead we, yes, instead we did a, a, a pirate MMO, actually Pirates of the Burning Sea. I worked on for five years after that. Um, but for Delta Green, we did put out a, um, a video, like a short video clip of like a, like an agent entering a room with a, uh, like a dark young inside of it. Um, and, uh, uh, we also, Scott wrote a series of uh, stories for the website we had in those days. That was the uh, New Orleans um, stuff he did. It was kind of a promotional item for that, to promote that project for a while. Yeah, and eventually um, it turned into the DeMont clan uh, in, um, it eventually turned into the DeMont clan in Countdown. No, in, um, sorry, Targets yeah. of Opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there and is... and the, the, that fiction series is available as its own PDF, right? That was the uh, yes, the uh, uh, yeah, down in the delta is is what it, what we wound up titling it. Yeah, that game was going to be sort of XCOMy, but real time instead of turn based. Um, you were going to control like a squad of like three agents um, who you'd be you know moving through investigation and so forth. Um, and it you know it was it was a cool concept, um, but uh, we could not get a publisher for it. Um, those same people, however, um, several companies later are actually doing a Delta Green game now, video game now. Um, we've not really done a formal announcement about that, so it's going to stay tuned for a while. Um, it's a very small project, definitely like an indie strategy game kind of project. Um, so it's not like a big shooter or anything crazy like that. Um, but it should be cool, and we're helping them with it. Um, and when they are ready to talk about it further, we'll do so. What else we got, Bayos? Um, it's really kind of caught up again. Mm. Uh, someone asked us if you could release the prototype today to see what it was like. <laughs> I don't think you could even run it on anything today. I, yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't... Yeah, I don't, was, don't... Uh, didn't they code that on stone uh, or something with yeah, like a uh, hammer and chisel? It's, stone the tablet. It's, in Ac it's in Acadian, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, and the I mean the prototype we had was I mean it was barely like a tech demo. It was you know like maybe two minutes long. It was just some agents walking into a room and uh, or two rooms and then discovering yeah. a dark young. And it did out. scan times. Let's let's not forget that John was motion captured for it. Yeah, well I was I was body scanned for it. So I dressed up as like a you know hapless academic, which go figure. Um, and then uh, they did like a head to toe. <laughs> color body scan of me like standing still um and we used that we, it was a technical demonstration we were doing to show like we can do this thing called normal mapping that's really cool and innovative and this is like <laughs> ago, so. yeah oh, man i was hoping they put you in the ping pong walls and like the whole awesome. greed suit like I yeah say, no. this is way pre ping yeah, pong balls. Balls. <laughs> yeah we need to forced... develop ping pong ball technology yeah. Yeah. it did force john to stand in the least flattering position possible <laughs> So oh yeah, it's it's ridiculous. ridiculous. There was just yeah, like it's ridiculous. But now the good the good thing is like we do have like somewhere on a hard drive like you know a super high resolution like full color body scan of me in costume from like twenty years ago. So at some point <laughs> when I die and my brain is uploaded to the internet, then yeah. they'll have this model of me they can use for the hologram presence. You'll have the future. Yeah, we'll just avatar. we'll just have you t pose on for over your own grave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, I see another one. Baz. Yeah, we got another one now. Uh, Yithian source book. Will it touch upon the conflict with? Okay, this word because I see two L's and span. My my knowledge of Spanish makes me want to say a Y sound. 
Yes. It's, like, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I had a con- 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 conversation Lord with, Lord. with Ken Hyde about this years and years ago because I had the same question. And no, it's uh, Loiger with a hard L because okay, it comes yeah. out of the uh, Welsh tradition, not the Spanish. The answer, okay. the answer is yes. It will touch on that. Uh, I'm about sixty thousand words done on that book, um, but uh, it's important to consider that to the the Ithians, the Loigor are the equivalent of a hard gamma radiation for humans, or it's an annoyance. It's not a. It's this thing that occurs within a field in this certain area. And yeah, they we don't to, go there. <laughs> they have to correct for it. That's yeah. so. It's not a. It's not as much a war as you might imagine. As a uh, yeah, that's Chernobyl. We don't go in that time. We go around it, um, kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, there is a, a specific entry on that. Cool. I like Yoiger better. <laughs> Yoiger. 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 Yeah, so, this sounds so dorky. Then like yeah. Yoiger. It's or you know or it's like a, an uh, yogurt pop product. Yeah, <laughs> you want a yogur? Hit me. It's, it's like another it's all the sad kids looking in the fridge. <laughs> Purple stuff. <laughs> yogurt. Yogurt. Yogur. 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 Yeah. Mom, uh, where's the yogur? <laughs> <laughs> uh, unrelated, but have you guys played the Paranoia RPG? That's the one that surprisingly acted as my gateway into the RPG scene. Oh, yes. sure. Yes. I love Paranoia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Way. Well, I mean, it's been a long time, but the I first one that originally came out, uh, yeah, I yes. did. It was, it's hilarious. That's, that's the one I played. Uh, what was the, my favorite? My favorite scenario was the yellow clearance black box blues, which was <laughs> fantastic. Just what's in the box battle where you're just killing clones as you go by the dozens. It was great fun. Yeah, I love that game. Uh, NCC360 asks, will there be more Cold War era content? Love the era and the espionage that comes with it. Eventually, I would think so. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm working on operational histories. I imagine I'm going to be, um, if not playable content, dealing with a lot of you know, what Delta Green was doing uh, mm-hmm. during that period. Um, yeah, it, but, it would be it would be a lot of fun to explore some of the details and slotting what Delta Green was up to in the mix of the uh, the Red Scare and the FBI cracking down on everyone and Hoover trying to annihilate the CIA um, and uh, um, with, at the same time with the unknown and wouldn't be public for forty years issue of the uh, Venona. Um, program, right, where the USSR actually did have heavy access throughout the U.S. government. Um, But nobody in the U.S. government that was perpetuating the Red Scare was talking about that, right? So from the public perspective, all anyone saw was the um, unwarranted horror show, uh, which a lot of it was unwarranted. But then there was this sort of hard core nugget of there actually were security problems well, yeah, happening. It was, it wasn't. It, it stopped being a national security issue. And it became a culture war issue. You know. Right. 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 But uh, but but yeah, fill, fitting fitting dealt. But using that, uh, yeah, I mean, have that as the uh, as kind of the some of the backdrop of a Delta Green game sounds very fruitfully stressful. I've got some stuff that's going to show up in um, <clears throat> this as yet untitled century of Delta Green project I'm working on. And I have actually play tested some of the stuff uh, where you're going to have stuff that takes place in the 60s, the 50s, the 70s with Delta Green and the 80s. And the 70s material is about hijacking uh, Delta Green's files before the FBI can get their hands on them. Uh, there's, a, there's a thing where you, in order to get into the you know, Navy base where they've been locked up before the FBI can show up and seize them, because, uh, you know, Hoover is not Delta Green's best friend, um, uh, you uh, you decide that, I know, we'll totally, uh, you know, bypass all the, you know, normal security and stuff. We'll just open a gate to the, to the warehouse God. and load the files up and roll them out on, you know, um, cargo dollies, and it'll be super simple. 
Um, that's all we have to do. And you can imagine how that went during playtest. <laughs> Nothing exactly, can go wrong with this plan. Yeah, it went exactly <laughs> the way you'd imagine. Um, my, my favorite part being that, uh, you know, there's all these Delta Green people who have to actually physically move the cargo dollies through the gate, right? Why well, one team goes through and secures the warehouse, like, okay, they're the security team. And then these poor dummies have to come in and go pick up the filing cabinets and move them. But they don't have just an endless supply of people. So the guys taking the sand hits going back and forth through the gate <laughs> are the NPCs, you know, as they move these <laughs> cargo dollies full of stuff. And eventually that, you know, that's why not so many guys were all that hip to get, you know, back on board with the, you know, with the cowboys afterwards. It's you asked, well, I can literally feel the brain damage. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but going back and forth through the game, they, they burn up a bunch of Delta Green personnel just, just moving, moving filing cabinets. <laughs> you know, which I thought was, that that seems like a good plan, yeah. Um, but yes, it turns into a, you know, three-way shootout between Delta Green and the FBI and a, you know, whole bunch of extra-dimensional bullshit that wouldn't be there, but Delta Green's protecting <laughs> us from extra-dimensional bullshit, which is why the warehouse is now with extra-dimensional bullshit. So, yeah, there'll be there'll be some Cold War stuff that comes in in the 60s and the 50s as well. You'll get some you'll get some Soviets, maybe some Red Chinese or whatever uh, stuff going on as well. Uh, as I love the idea out. that those, those, those guys moving the boxes, like, they, they burn a whole bunch of bonds over the course of the afternoon, and they get home and they hate their families, and their wife is like, what the fuck happened today? <laughs> like, I had to move to boxes, honey? It. Like... <laughs> Sorry, they were really <laughs> now. <laughs> Can you help me move this box? Just shatters a beer bottle across the wall, <laughs> runs out of the house. You, you don't have to, to, to help you move. You know? yeah. yeah, and then he set the box on fire. <laughs> it only had dishes. Uh, Hachibushu asks, and I'll I'll uh, direct this to you guys one at a time so we can keep it ordered, but. Uh, what inspires your adventure writing? Caleb, why don't you give that be the first one on that? Um, I work almost entirely backwards from like theme and abstraction, like uh, bereavement like, that I played with this guy started off as like, man, it's fucked up how the more people die, the less guilt there is on you, right? <laughs> Like, uh, that was just, <laughs> yeah, that was just pure pandemic shit. And then I was like, I'll need to write a scenario about that. And then I just. And then there were weird, scary puppets in a church. Like it's 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 totally ass backwards. Like most of the time, you come up with an idea, or you see something in the concrete world, and um, you kind of discover what the story is about. That's at least how I write fiction: is uh, more image focused and like, oh, that's what I was really writing about. By the time I get to the end of it, but but when I write a scenario, it's just it completely backwards. Like that's a scary abstract concept. How can it eat you? Like, um, yeah, and. Um, that's where I usually start. So, Shane, how about you? Uh, most often from uh, either it, it's usually some mix of uh, of of thinking of some piece of Delta Green lore or Lovecraftian lore or some of the stories that we've that were instrumental in founding all of this that feels like it hasn't been um, explored too much sometimes it's based on that sometimes it's just uh news headlines um i'm a i'm a sucker for um sort of weird science um it's but mainly not really weird science as much as genuine science but that has an has an easy to find weird twist to it tilt to it if you look at it from a skewed perspective that's that's my bread and butter so i usually start from some mix of those two things and then that and then and then it wind up with some kind of core uh image as caleb caleb said of um oh that's a fucked up thing and then how do we make players get to that and regret it not the players the agents sometimes the players uh glancy how about you uh repeat the question please um what inspires your adventure writing well um Oof. That's really hard. It's whatever catches in the drain. Also, this cat. This this cat also. <laughs> uh, but um, I would say that uh, whatever catches in my 
drain from all the media and material that's uh, going through it. I had um, somehow uh, heard a story about um, Marcus Luttrell, the SEAL who was, uh, and I've told this story before, the SEAL who from Lone Survivor, about some horrible shit that happened to him when he's back in America, where somebody, sh- some guy shot his companion animal that had been given to him by the VA, you know, to help him deal with his PTSD. Like, somebody went up and shot his bond for no reason, right? It was just what these dicks did for entertainment on the weekend, because there was nothing on, I guess, cable to watch. And that story sort of ended up uh, you know, reading about that. I had never heard of Luttrell. I hadn't connected him to the, the SEAL team that got uh, wiped out in Afghanistan. But reading that story ended up inspiring the whole, you know, Dog Soldiers project, which I'll hopefully be turning into uh, Mr. Uh, Ivy there before the end of the year. Um, but it started there. You know. It started there just from a, a random story I ran across. And I think I was looking for that because I had had a girlfriend who was into doing rescue animal stuff and was also into doing uh, stuff where she was um, she would do hospice for animals or in a bad way that had been picked up. Um, and she had uh, found this, um, this Mastiff that she had uh, picked up through friends who'd found this dog as, a, as an abandoned stray. And um, it was a big older dog and it was covered, it was, it was real thin. Uh, it was covered with these giant round tumors. And this, you know, uh, Mastiffs have that, you know, they're not very hairy. And yes, go away. And <laughs> they're not very hairy. And so every feature of this animal's skeleton and the giant tumors stood out on this dog. And um, involved with them rescuing it or whatever, the dog showed signs of abuse. And so I had started looking up stories about animal abuse because I had this idea where I would write a story where the only witness to the mythos problem is an animal. Where your way in is you find an animal that has been subjected to some sort of horrible mythos nonsense, possibly by a sorcerer who's doing experiments or whatever. And this animal is now going to be your your way in. And having to interpret, you know, its physical body and interpret its behavior and interpret its uh, its physical location in the map, you know, to sort of like navigate your way to where the problem is taking place. How the, my my first sort of inspiration on this was, and sort of get revenge for what has happened to this poor dog, you know, um, uh, get some payback for it. Um, but. Um, that because I was looking into that, and then I, you know, accidentally found the Latrell story about somebody being mean, you know, somebody murdering his his uh, companion animal. Yeah, that that ended up dovetailing into the whole, you know, the whole idea of uh, of trying to find a way to make Nodens uh, less boring. You know, <laughs> um, and uh, it it really just depends on what gets caught in the grate. You know, there's media, there's movies, there's you know stuff that's always going through it, you know, I just, you know, sat down and devoured, you know, uh, Channel Zero just a few weeks ago, maybe last month, uh, I ripped through all four seasons of Channel Zero, which is filled with things I wish I could have thought of first, you know, and I'm just gonna <laughs> have to find ways to, 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 to put those, you know, mally that stuff around and file the numbers off so it'll be useful to abuse players with, you know? Inspire handlers. Um, that's that's sort of how scenarios get built. They don't get built because I've imagined an action sequence or a thing in my head. Um, it's it's the it's an aggregation of nasty little nodules that build up like barnacles of a ship until eventually you've got something or uh, uh, take shape almost almost organically, literally like. Well, uh, between that story and God's Teeth, I would change my answer to animal cruelty. So if you would <laughs> like to write for Delta Green, just volunteer for the ASPCA, and it's yes. a matter of time. Yeah, and um, if, if you don't ever write a good scenario, hey, you save some dogs. 
So, certainly, certainly, there's a point where you start hoping that the guys who are being mean to animals <laughs> will turn out to be cultists, so you can use your Delta Green license to kill to erase them. You know. Oh no! I was raised. Uh, my grandma. Well, you don't want to say puppy mill, but there were a lot of puppies coming out at a sort of mill-like frequency. So <laughs> your, mother, your grandma. Uh, <laughs> Granny's yeah, gonna go. Uh, Granny's gonna but, have uh, to go. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a novel about that when I got my uh, MA. And uh, have you ever read any of that uh, forensic veterinary science stuff? Oh dear God! Mm -mm. Oh my God! If you want to go down to uh, Nightmare Town, I don't uh, talk about like serial killer profilers, but they're using I'm good. dead Thanks. animals. I'll be yeah, right. it's uh, it's it's horrific. Yeah, the the guy uh, who wrote was, Mind, uh, the guy who wrote Mind Hunter about serial killers. I ripped through his book very easily. It would, uh, very easy to read. The next book he wrote was about people involved in the killing of children. Child murders. Never finished it. Could not mm -hmm. finish it. I'm here to tell you if he did a book about people being mean to animals, I would be unable to get past the title page. <laughs> that just, yeah, that wouldn't work for me at all. I, I won't get specific, but I, I remember a line. She said, um, like, the interviewer was just like, why did you, sp why would you spend this many resources to see who killed a stray dog? Like, you know, there are actual problems in the world. And and she's like, well, I didn't. I spent this many resources. I spent this many resources to catch a serial killer, but I caught him when he was 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's right. like, it's like, oh, fuck. Like that that is a person <laughs> that has seen too much shit. Yeah. Uh yeah, like and you know she's just like the nicest little hey how are you like vet in the world, but like you go back into the lab room just hey, Dennis. dead eyed stares. <laughs> I Dennis, yeah. Dennis, what what happy things inspire your adventure writing when when writing? Look at the your rabbits, game? Billy. Look at the uh, rabbits. <laughs> it's always um it's it's always it, it it's always the same thing with me. It's always me. Uh, going, huh, and then laughing and then writing something down and it's like, investigator digs himself up, or <laughs> what if the rooms just didn't stop? Uh, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and then I build out from there. It's, oh, it's, a, it's a, like Scott said, it's like a hard, fleshy nodule with stuff growing off of it that go in all directions and eventually goes into a flow chart of clues that kind of always lead back to the goopy, horrible thing at the middle. Um, like cancer. Yeah, it is like <laughs> a cancer. Um, but it's it's almost always just a single idea uh, where I just go, oh, that that's the neat reveal. That's the thing that when the agents get there, they'll go, oh, fuck, remember that time you dug yourself up? Uh, those are the moments I'm looking for. The most recent one is the... Sentinels of Twilight, uh, the giant Kinyani non-human entities that can change size and be invisible. And the idea there was, what if they could just make you not see them? What if other people could see them 20 foot tall, half naked, pale humanoids, and you had no idea they were there? Where is he? And he's literally right behind you, you know, getting ready to grab you and drag you underground. Um, and I just... I'm just out to creep people out. Um, so that's kind of the core of it. Um, Tynes, how about you? Um, you know, I'm heavily uh, research based. Um, and so if I, you know, if, if whatever the initial sort of remit is, if I'm going to do like a cane yellow thing or a Nyagtha thing or whatever, um, I'll go back and look at the stories again if I've seen them before um, and kind of read through those, think about those depending on what they do or what they refer to or when they're set, I'll go look into more about that in history and Wikipedia basically about, you know, okay, what about that? And then that usually just like, before you know it, like you just trip over some like crazy bullshit that really happened uh, or that's true. And that's usually where I find that little nugget that gets my attention and gets me really curious. Um, the scenario I'm currently working on, I mean, there were a number of those, but um one of them was I was just like scrolling around in like Google Maps around Atlanta uh, doing some research for this project. And I noticed this neighborhood, the suburban neighborhood uh, named Druid Hills. 
And I'm like, what the fuck? Why is there a suburb called Druid Hills? <laughs> and then I, you know, and so I'm like, tell me, computer, about Druid Hills. And like, oh, that's where the co-founder of the KKK lived in a mansion he built called Stonehenge. <laughs> oh, maybe I should write about that motherfucker. And so, like, that's like that's the thing. Like, you just start doing research, and like, it's all there. I think Ken Hyde is a saying, like, it's not writing, it's just research. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the deal. So like I usually find start finding things that catch my attention, my curiosity, and that are the hooks that I can like hang mythos y, delta greeny, whatever stuff on. Um, but it comes out of the research. And so I I just find research incredibly inspirational. Um, not just for like historical stuff and facts, but also in fiction, like looking at you know, for the current project, I was looking at uh, I re- I reread uh, Henry Cutner's The Salem Horror, um, which is like a shitty story. Like, there's no particular reason why anyone should care about this fucking short story from like 80 years ago. But you know, digging into it, trying to understand like what was he trying to do, what is in there that I might be able to like extract some kind of value out of, or get some kind of an idea or inspiration from. Like, you have to go. I feel like you have to go back to that stuff and see what's there, so you know then like where do I go from here? Like, how do I take what was there, whatever like tiny thing was interesting to somebody, and how do I like blow on that little flame until it explodes and kills everyone? <laughs> what was the uh, the quote that I always liked from Times, which I off to prepare pretend that i came up with was uh uh, when you cut history it bleeds weird Mm. yeah uh, yeah, you're not wrong john no no like history is really fucked up man it's terrible this this planet is useless (laughs) it's horrible (laughs) how do you really feel john (laughs) (laughs) all right uh lz's lz's this asks the meta, or uh, the meta plot of the handler's guide is fantastic, but I know a lot of people are a little intimidated by it. And do you have any tips on the big plot beats to hit over a campaign? Uh, I, I I'll, on a high level, I have a difficult time understanding the concept of meta plot. I hear it bandied about a lot. Um, it's become very kind of popular to go. If your game has a, any history in it, that's meta plot. We. We don't really care what you do with the game. They're all supposed to be um, ideas for operations or things your agents can do or things you can give or take. Um, nothing's presented in there as you must follow this and we're if you defy this, we will punish you in the future by releasing a book that will completely go in an opposite direction. I feel like we keep the same theme no matter what, um, but on a high level, I... I I, I, I got to confess, I find that uh, confusing. It's it's really a popular term. I see it on Twitter. All People constantly going like, the meta plot of Delta Green. You, you mean that when you're playing in the 2000s, the history we provide going back, is that what they mean? Really what you they're know? talking about is a giant collection of plot hooks. That we, we, we yeah, it's just, yeah. A, it's just an aggregation of plot yeah. hooks that we, that we hope you will pick up and abuse your players with. But you yeah, don't have to. I, yeah, well, I guess I'm trying to understand the 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 current idea of meta plot. It, it seems to be more stringent than anything I've ever understood before. Because when I well, write I a game book, I just go, "This yeah, I is." I think it's a carryover from maybe some other game lines than Delta Green. Okay. Um, yeah, the, I mean, there's definitely a period uh, going back quite a ways when White Wolf was doing their various World yeah. of Darkness games, and they would literally have like you know a year long meta plot that would stretch across multiple books, and you kind of yeah, yeah, stick yeah. with it. And yeah. that's like I don't think that's such a thing anymore. But I mean, definitely we have a we have a giant book full of lore, right? The whole Hanner's Guide is like this gigantic history. Um, and I, I can imagine some people are probably feel like, oh my God, how can I memorize all this for my players? Right, and like, right. and the, happily, you don't have to. It's yeah, really yeah. just there to, to read and enjoy and be inspired by. Um, but you can also just grab last things last and just run it. And you don't need to know Jack about the, all that history stuff to have a great time. Uh, I think yeah, that's, that's that, that, that history stuff doesn't even have to exist. Is it, you know, it's a bigger thing. Like you want to run last things last and they re- reach behind the curtain and it's something completely contrived by you at your own table. That's totally fine, and we love that. Go nuts. It's your game. 
Also, yeah, reality I, doesn't have a meta plot anymore. So Delta <laughs> Green, Delta Green. Like, yeah, I mean, using so, the FBI, one FBI guy could go like, hey, what do you do? It's like, oh, I, I hunt child pornographers. The other guy was like, you mean the ones who ship the mainstays cabinets underneath the cap <laughs> capital tunnels? Like, and that's the conversation they're just going to have in the office. Like, what, what truth do you think you're going to get out of Delta Green? Like, the right. second... The second your players think they know what's going on and start like asking questions like what happened in the 69 thing, which is like, oh, you think Johnson was really the president? Oh, you're obviously not read in. <laughs> yeah, like he just, it, yeah, it, there is no truth. Do whatever you want. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me, uh, so, so I would say with the, as far as being intimidated by what's there, um, by all means, don't be. Because again, every, every line of that book is intended to be a little hook for you to uh, expand on. So just instead of trying to take in the whole, uh, just sort of fil flip through it, right? And it, when you find something, when you find something in the timeline, for instance, that you find interesting or that sort of sparks your imagination, then circle it and build a game around that, right? Build out the details from there um, without reference to everything else. You don't have to know everything that's coming. And what one thing that now there a lot of those things are interconnected, right? If you were to take the timeline um, at face value, but you have the advantage of number one, the agents don't know jack shit. So even if you have a player at your table who is twice as familiar with all that stuff as you, as you, um, that doesn't mean their agents know that because. What is on the page, you can twist it and warp it to whatever extent you. We actively encourage that to happen, right? Because what? Our, because our interest is having a good time with the game, and um, this is a setting that's filled with unnatural. So you can easily come up with, you can easily come up with whatever excuse you want to. Um, to uh, to make history change itself, to suit your narrative and to keep your players guessing. So yeah. use them as ingredients. You know, don't feel don't feel like you have to take in the whole thing at once. But I think I'm understanding this more, which is John's reference to the vampire books. We are unlike that. It is not it, there. There's not a book that goes like, here's what the Camarilla is doing in 1996, mm -hmm. and then in 97, the 96 book, you have to throw it out and kind of start again like we don't do that um mm -mm. we, we yeah. you know we've not, i we've need not to know agent one. alphonse's celerity score i need to know <laughs> um <laughs> yeah we're not we're obviously not trying to build year by year storylines oh no. yeah. that people need to fit within and if we tried to it would be a ridiculously hilarious disaster because we can't stick to a schedule it's not yeah no and that's the thing like we're not we're not really very invested in trying to explain current events. Like that's what Reddit's for, right? Or discussion forums. Yeah. Like that's where you talk about that stuff. That's great. We put out adventures. We put out, you know, kind of source books for older things and whatnot, but we're not trying to say like, okay, 2021's over now. Here's a source book explaining exactly what was really going on. Like we don't. Right. Do right. Delta green is for your agents to standard current events is for you. to standard. <laughs> Kogan Sympathy just said, did times just do the LARP signal for obfuscate? <laughs> <laughs> no, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you um, Ray, Ray's article on the bad vampire of life, LARP. Uh, he did an article and I think it was it, it was I don't want to play anymore. It was like a it was, it was, it was, Oh yeah. Yeah, he had he had photos of uh that he it was like in Shadus or something. Yeah, it was in like his, yeah. his proposed like new hand signal for, for the <laughs> vampire LARP. And one of them was like, I don't want to play anymore. I was like, mm. That was awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, so no to the meta plot. Just write this down. Helicarrier's <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. The truth is. Yeah, false. I think I okayed Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, uh, I, two or three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah someone was like, there. I want to play Harry Potter Delta Green. I was like, that's cool. Go I, have had fun. Some, I had some Delta Green Harry Potter ideas. Um, More, more let's, <laughs> let's see. 
We're uh, way we, less transphobic, so you've got some thematic issues uh, to, <laughs> to, to to work out. I, I am happy to write the scenario where Pisces does what has to be done and puts J.K. Rowling down. <laughs> <laughs> what she's become can't be allowed to walk the earth. Yeah, uh, there's, our there's a great must like be made. Yeah, there's there's totally a good convention like one off scenario there where it's like, okay, agents, we've got we we've, we've learned about this like cult compound in Scotland where they're like <laughs> turning out cultists and they're like all teaching the kids, them like all the geometry use, and yeah, they use faux Latin. They think that they uh, belong to this underworld of yeah. You, know. you got to take them out. That's right. <laughs> but the younglings, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> fuck, 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 through fuck. a gate at a train station. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Envisioning all those scenes from Harry Potter, but with the Pisces Wetworks team just going through the salt, <laughs> yeah. the salt weapons. Stage case and yeah. just... <laughs> it's the boy who lived. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. SS guys with cockney outfits. It's really Armas. It's really Armas. Why is there a red dot in your lightning bolt? Does that mean that Voldemort's Oh my god! Devil's well, now I'm going to mod head. that uh, Call of Duty clean house level. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to learn how to program. No muggles. <laughs> yeah. So we've got about, uh, what, 15, 10, 15 minutes till we're going to yep. wrap this up. So let's let's get the, any last couple of questions here or talking points, or we can just uh, wind Scott up and let him go. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Isis. Uh, there's a question for Dennis. Uh, which art oh, shit. Um, from which scenario uh, funded from the conspiracy Kickstarter are you most interested in painting? Uh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. uh, it, it's tough. I've really enjoyed painting them. I, I just painted the destroyed F-16. Uh, with the flyby of the UFO, and that came out really nice. Um, each one I'm working on is my favorite at the moment, uh, and then when I look at it later, I go, oh, what are you doing? Um, but that's pretty standard art. Yeah. Like that's You'll talk to every artist, and they'll go, yeah, that's shit. Look at the new thing I'm working on. Um, I just finished all the Karatekia portraits. Um, I like painting those evil fuckers, so you know what you're shooting at. Yeah, that Galt uh, portrait was great. Was it? Did, did, oh, did you start with? Did you start with a like a photo model or something like that for him? I, yeah, I, it's actually my little brother. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, uh, but the um, the jacket is an SS jacket. H and K was from a photo. Yeah, there's everything's photo reference. That's pretty much you do it. Um, yeah, so you're but, a uh, Oh yes, I trace. Uh, no, um, <laughs> poser man. Uh, and I'm working on the one I'm I'm interested. In, uh, oh shit! No, my favorite one by far to date is the Migo one. So the guy with the pistol on the ground with mm -hmm. the Migo cross that I did after Torin's pencil drawing. The guy like struggling at an angle, with the pistol. <laughs> I did yeah. a painting of that, and it was quite fun. And and Torin has this great eye for kind of angled action. So I, 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 in the full his composition. Yeah, that that was those are both great great images. Like his original yeah. and your your take on. But you know, one I have I have a I have a quick back in the old days question. One thing that one thing that I kind of regret getting away from in eyes only and targets and then in the new books is the uh the 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 terrific. I don't even know if it continued in countdown, but the original Delta Green every image had this kind of Dry sardonic caption to it that I oh, yeah, just yeah. hilarious. John, were those right. all yours, or did you guys farm those out? I think that I think was, was probably all me. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Because I was, I was doing all the layout and the scanning art and stuff, and so yeah, yeah I, I think I did right. I forgot they had captions. Actually, that was that's funny. Yeah, yeah. He, spoke, he, spoke, <laughs> yeah. he spoke. He spoke, and men went mad. Stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We right. should we should put that back in the book. I mean, we're too bad Voyager was uh, was turned off. Yeah, the cameras are off. Yeah. yeah, the cameras. Yeah, are I, off. Fin yeah, I finished yeah. that image, and that was a huge series of mistakes. That whole image, <laughs> but it came out very well. It was like I'm gonna. I still thing. don't know what you're bitching little about. Hot. A star is just a little white dot. Holy fuck, man! You have no idea how many <laughs> dots there are on that page. <laughs> so, so yeah. and it was like 
fuck you, past Dennis. You're a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quarter of the image done. It's just hours of work to get down. Uh, you should resurrect that pointless style you were doing for that oh. Walker in the Waste picture. That Fuck. full page yellow you did that you, you spent like a hundred hours on it or whatever. Like you should do that again. <laughs> it forever. Well, it was Lisa, Lisa Free's watch. work was yeah. so beautiful that I can't imagine how much time she had to spend on those yeah. Chaosium works, Ring World, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. Someone does. Uh, someone asks. My friends and I love Alzis and want more stuff about this guy. Is there any more future plans about him? He's so dreamy. Uh, uh, I I wrote a very short story about Alziz, uh on my blog recently, um, which was quite fun. Um, was, this, was this about current day Alziz or back in the yes. time? Yes, was Alziz. Current, current, uh, and current day Alziz, Just for everybody, he's in China right now, um, but we don't really know why or what he's doing. Um, he's still walking around as my Stephen Alziz and there's maybe right the same. Don't really people. know. Yeah, I uh, haven't really defined what what exactly he's doing. Um, the story is 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 up uh, on the site. I forget what it's called, but it's you'll you'll recognize it very quickly. It mentions him by name, um, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't have any direct plans that wouldn't be set in a time Alzis was in control of fate. In um, there's a book that Falling Towers that we're working on that will deal with that time, um, but. No, no, no direct plans. Uh, although I do love him. Uh, and he originally appeared in my high school called Cthulhu group. That's that's where the fate comes from. So, you know, I have a, one. We might, if you don't mind expanding on that a little bit, um, one question that comes up is why not? Right. Is there something about the way you imagine that character that the world makes the him world less is, compelling as a current yeah. day thing? The world is ruined. It's done. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Not not interesting anymore. Yeah. No, I mean it's there seemed to be some sort of vague order going on in the nineties, or at least the outline of an order of keeping things from spilling out into the void. We are well past the point where there are any fences. Shit's just spewing all over the place out into the void instantly. And we call that, you know, the world now. I'm Compared to here. Where I, yeah. I'm glad to hear, Dennis, that those illusions gave you such comfort back in the <laughs> <laughs> I at least at least I could rely on about two thirds of the people falling within those fences. Like you could just kind of go, okay, if jail, if you do this, you're like there was a vague outline of some authority that would occur. Uh, mm-hmm. al- although it was extremely skewed and obviously very corrupt. Uh, what we have now is just straight up chaos. It's like overthrow the government, you get a Fox show. <laughs> don't, 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 you know, like it's it's like the A to B. There is no following. So Alziz, in my imagination, Alziz after two thousand one, the job is done. The, the it's the end of the world. Uh, we're just we're very impatient people. We think the end of the world is going to take place in an afternoon six months and Alziz is thinking 50 years or a thousand years or whatever but the, the ball is in play he, he no longer has himself with big pieces on the board things things are already falling to ruin and I think it's kind of terrifying to look around at the world now and remember the world as a kid um, a lot of people don't you know are, are too young to have the perspective of the, the, <laughs> thinking of the 70s and the 80s as sane and stable is a really <laughs> disturbing days. thing. It's a <laughs> fucking terrifying idea to go like, man, I miss how stable the 80s were. The 80s were incredibly <laughs> fucked up. And where, you know, I remember watching uh, the day after with my mom when we were when I was like a little kid and she was terrified and crying. And I was like, oh, that's nothing. Like, we're in New York. There'd be a five mile crater with lava at the bottom. It would be weird. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not. Don't even worry about it. There'll be nothing left. It'll just be. And and she started. She started weeping even more. And I was like, I'm trying to comfort you, woman. This is, it's okay. Um, I will. I'd like to segue this right over to someone who posted a second ago. King Redux TV uh, says, 
Never been here. Just wanted to wish everyone here a great day. And whatever challenges you're facing in life, know it always gets better, heart. <laughs> Thanks. I think Stay you're going to make it, y'all. Sentiment. <laughs> Sometimes you become part of the five mile pit of lava. I, you know, I don't know that we're going to, I don't know that we're going to top that as a, yeah. you know, <laughs> as a message to go out on. That might be our sign off sentiment. So. <laughs> message you should get from Stephen LZ's like on, as, on your, on your phone, it would show up like he's the guy. yeah no, LZ, he's, LZ seems like the side of guy to do XOXO after every song uh, yeah. yeah hey the, guys the is scallop there. tatters of the king must hide you till forever <laughs> see ya and it's CYA yeah. the, little, the little yellow sign emoji before the heart <laughs> All right. Um, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, 72 viewers uh, in about two hours. Um, thank you again for everyone back the Conspiracy Kickstarter. And um, we don't have anything on the schedule yet, but uh, we will be um, streaming more games here periodically. And uh, it is September. So if you would like to uh, subscribe to the channel, it is 20% off this that month. All Scott as well. I, lo I love how... I love how bizarre this all is. I don't understand anything that was just said. Like, 20% <laughs> off what? Like, are they paying <laughs> out? What? Just don't, don't worry about it. Okay, hey, hey gonna... we'll be in the crater. Now your mom. <laughs> now your mom. And I'm I know, it's terrifying. You. It's okay, Don't worry. It's like we'll be in the crater. It's Why like are you crying? It's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> it's okay, One mom. thing I need to get clarity on. Scott, did you make a second cat? Because I just saw the same cat <laughs> in two positions at the same time. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Have there been two cats the entire time? How many cats are there? A lot, a lot of people entanglement. Yeah. There are two well, perfectly closure. black cats over here. They're sisters. That's, uh, For now. that's Ash and Wednesday. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. cute. All right. Somewhere are around they, are, here, there's a, more of them. The, well, uh, Pie doesn't usually clamb up on me. She usually just sits down by the side and stabs me until uh, she gets my attention. And the newly acquired kitten, who we have at this moment is currently going under the name Omar Little, uh, is um, <laughs> is oh, yes. uh, not willing to climb the stairs yet. So there, are, we have oh. we have worked our way back up to original pagan publishing numbers of cats in this house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to get those numbers up. Pump those yeah. up. So, yes, Omar ain't coming because it's the second cats. floor. So, yeah, make sure they third. piss in the floor vents because that really helps the ambiance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, then it just like spreads letters. around the entire house and yeah. just kind of aerates real... everything. That is not a trick um, that these cats have learned. That was a that was a monkey trouble thing. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was your girl's monkey in trouble. Those girls took out a what a seven hundred dollar laser printer one time yes. with oh, their no. bladders. <laughs> it be on I, everything. In, I took it in to get repaired, and the guy's like, "Are you fucking kidding? Me? <laughs> <laughs> Put that out of here! There, you no, know, there's nothing to fix. <laughs> Take it away." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, and uh, we will also put this up on the Delta Green YouTube channel. I've been recording. Yeah, the Arc, uh, it's it's a yeah the Arc Dream Presents channel, um, which which gets sort of very occasional uh, uh, updates. So, but this uh, is but this is going to go up there for the for public consumption and archival. Purposes. Yes, future uh, court cases. Yeah, it's all good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not the two weeks uh, limited. Uh, release of Twitch. So, right. um, thank you, everyone. Uh, if you're at Gen Con, leave. God. Be safe. <laughs> love you. It's not worth it. Get out. Um, but also, thank you for watching us. And if you're elsewhere, stay safe and uh, have a great day. So, bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. Be seeing you. <laughs>